With seven days to spare, N9SA has achieved the thought to be impossible task of returning a Kerbal from lunar space. With proper funding reinstated and a new goal to land a Kerbal on the lunar surface in five years' time, the program kicks its science initiative into full gear. The plan will be to collect as much data from translunar space as possible, as well as from the surface of the moon. With the Moonstone program now closed, a new Raven 5 launch vehicle is given multiple missions starting in December of 1969. Its debut flights intend to deploy four small TISATs in lunar orbit before soft landing two probes on the surface. Unfortunately, the first flight experiences a loss of efficiency during initial ascent and is left with not enough fuel to capture into lunar orbit if sent there. It is decided to use the transfer stage to increase the current orbital inclination in low Earth orbit instead, as the TISAT should still be able to acquire useful data along said trajectory. 28 minutes into flight, R5 lights its engine and brings its orbital inclination to 53 degrees. The small onboard TISATs do not have propulsion of their own. Instead, they will be oriented towards the sun and unfold Dwal Long's solar panels once detached from the R5 transfer stage. This first deployment does not go as intended, as one of the two solar arrays is destroyed immediately. It is unclear if there was a problem with separation or if the TISAT spin motors caused this disassembly, but connection with the satellite has not weakened. The remaining solar array is extended and the trajectory of the satellite is monitored. Although technically spin stabilized, it is believed the rotation is unstable and will likely not remain oriented towards the sun for very long. Deployment of the remaining TISAT is performed differently, this time not firing its spin motors immediately, opting to wait for an adequate separation with the transfer stage instead. This is to no avail, however, as the satellite encounters the same structural failure with one of the solar arrays. Again, the satellite is operational, is able to fire its spin motors and extend its panel, but this one is believed to be in an even worse orientation than the first. The rest of the mission is instructed to deorbit, and largely the mission is considered a failure. A second Raven 5 lifts off from Cape Canaveral and will be the final launch of the 1960s. Carrying an identical payload as the previous attempt, it soars into the night sky. Reaching orbit with no unplanned occurrences, R5 is go for translunar injection. During the third day of its mission, R5 has captured into lunar orbit, the first order of business deploying TISATs number 3 and 4. Possible structural hindrances are thought to be the primary reason deployment has gone wrong with the first two satellites, and these have been accounted for in the vehicle assembly building. Out here around the moon, however, it's too late for any tests or analysis. TISAT-3 breaks its solar panel just like the first two satellites, and is deployed into the same exact inefficient orientation as well. A small amount of science will likely still be able to be collected, but electric charge will most likely not last very long. 
TiSat 4 is, understandably, assumed to meet the same fate as the previous satellites. As such, it has decided to deploy its solar arrays before detaching as a last resort. Incredibly, this allows the satellite to cleanly separate from the transfer stage and deploy as intended. For the first time, a TiSat is set to be operational for its full lifetime. Now R5 is clear to proceed with its primary directive in lunar orbit, landing its probe on the surface. The transfer stage lowers its orbit during the next revolution before depleting the remainder of its fuel as a braking maneuver. The lander is deployed with around 500 meters per second to kill before touchdown. All is going to plan until one of the four engines on the probe initially misfires, causing the vessel to spin. RCS is unable to correct the rotation and flight control on the ground, in a panic, misaligns the lander further by firing and cutting engines in attempt to rectify the problem, but choosing the wrong engine to cut. Despite the panicked efforts to realign the craft, R5's lander has failed and crashes into the surface of the moon, again failing its mission. Raven 5's track record is starting out very poorly, but still holds potential for future launches and will carry on. The next planned mission will utilize the iconic, tried, and surprisingly true launch vehicle, Spud. Extra power is needed to leave the surface of the Earth with its unique payload. Despite many failed lunar landings in the past, N9SA intends to land a mobile probe or rover onto the surface of the moon. Known officially as TR1-4-N613, should a successful landing occur, it could realistically minimize soft landing missions and their inevitable high failure rate by simply traversing the surface of the moon to more interesting places rather than having another probe land there. This could prove to provide quite a lot of science while also minimizing launches, by extension saving precious time and money to pursue other endeavors. This mission, however, will not have backups or second chances. By principle, if the mission fails, sending it again would lose further funds and time, practically defeating its purpose entirely. The one-shot, light-in-the-dark mission successfully reaches orbit of the Earth. However, there is a problem with onboard avionics. For one reason or another, the spacecraft does not react to any attitude controls or engine gimbal. The mission is, for now, stranded in low Earth orbit. Turning off and on avionic systems is to no avail, and it is assumed faulty, but there will be time to blame the engineers later. For the next few hours and several orbits, teams on the ground scratch their heads in an attempt to reinstate control of the craft. Eventually, a method is cobbled together via manually controlling for control on various reaction control thrusters that luckily respond to ground. Though a very slight, unfixable rotation is present and causing difficulty, orientation is more or less corrected and stable. A translunar trajectory is planned, but will be much more hands-on than simply pointing towards the correct attitude and firing the engine. Controlled from the ground, a pilot is quickly briefed on the jerry-rigged method of attitude control the vessel currently finds itself in, and will use said method to ensure the spacecraft is heading towards the moon. The time comes to fire the engines, and luckily they do not fail. Halfway through the translunar injection, the onboard avionics come to life and suddenly take control of the craft, responding to control and continuing the burn with no more need for alternative attitude control methods. A great relief floods over ground control, believing the mission to be saved and on track. And according to telemetry and tracking systems, the spacecraft is indeed on its way to the moon as intended. Capturing into a very low orbit of the moon, TISATs 5 and 6 are deployed more so to save fuel than to provide any sort of usefulness. An orbit this low will decay rapidly, and they are expected to impact the lunar surface quite soon. 
After several orbits, just as a place to land is chosen, an engineer bursts into flight control with an urgent message regarding the ongoing mission. Faults in the design, as evident by blueprints and subsequent testing, mean the rover's landing stage is not able to be detached from the transfer stage, a supposed missing decoupler part to blame. This hits N9SA as a heavy blow after reaching this far in the mission, overcoming previous curveballs. An emergency meeting is held, as the engineer is allowed to remain in a private viewing area. A unanimous decision arises to use the remaining fuel in the transfer stage to land on the lunar surface. There is an extremely low chance of a successful mission at this point, but with any luck, the engine bells will be sufficient to hold the craft upright. Figuring out how to bring the rover to the surface later well, can be dealt with when we get there. For now, timing is everything. The large, unthrottable engines aren't necessarily the best way to land something on the moon. The spacecraft fires its engines and brings itself closer to the surface. Connection begins to weaken as it approaches. At the time of launch, it was a new moon, meaning the entire near side of the moon was veiled in darkness. Definitely an oversight by N9SA before launch, but the ramifications of this is a very slim landing zone just on the edge of losing connection with the Earth and still being in sunlight. Unfortunately, lunar satellites are very scattered and uncontrollable, providing questionable, if any, communications coverage at the time. The spacecraft slows its speed above the surface and begins to fall, aiming to burn its engines seconds before impact. These firings are slightly off, however, and the craft impacts the surface at 34 meters per second. The excessive impact speed and a late burn sends the vehicle rover first down the crater side it ended up landing on. By some miracle, portions of the rover survive and are able to be freely detached. The true extent of the damage is unknown. However, some instruments are operational, two wheels appear responsive, and at least one solar panel is providing power. Though the rover is able to drag itself freely, doing so will likely cause even more damage, and so it is to remain stationary. Electric charge will likely last over a week before the probe goes dark, and after then, it's possible during sunrise once a month, the probe may just barely have enough power to turn on systems and say hello to Earth. The rover mission is considered a partial success, an albeit rough landing was technically performed successfully, and plenty of scientific data was gained from the surface. Shortly after the rover mission, a third Raven 5 was readied for a third lunar landing attempt. Unfortunately, the mission barely left the ground. Upon ignition, the vehicle fell to the pad before lifting off, and immediately a booster failed, causing the rocket to dive into the surface just to the side of the launch pad. The end of 1969 to 1970 is a very rough start to the decade for N9SA, but surely bad luck will run out eventually. It's only a matter of time. Time being the most essential resource to the program, however, feels like it's always running out. Hopefully next episode we will see some success, maybe turn our eyes towards a coming Venus transfer window. Anyways, I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and peace out.